Well, I'm not sure about the illustrious part, but I know confused is one of them. So let's do this. Let's enter into a word of prayer this morning before we get into the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you, God, for um, bringing us into this new year. Uh, a new year, Lord, that um, really every day is, is a day that uh, is filled with your grace and your mercy. And Lord, a day that uh, we get to serve you and a day that we just get to glorify you. So even going into the new year, Lord, it's uh, nothing different. Uh, we continue doing what we've done in serving you and in loving you and testifying your name. And so God, this morning, uh, may you be edified, may you be glorified and magnified here in this place. Um, just by our desire to worship you, Lord, um, in spirit and truth. And so, God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, good morning. Happy New Year. Let us open our Bibles to Mark chapter 14 this morning as we get into the Word. I pray each of you had a great Christmas time and also a neat um, New Year's time as well. It's good to see all of you back. And if anybody needs a Bible, please raise your hand. We'd love to have you use one during service. So if you need one, we are going to be covering verses 10 through 31 this morning in Mark chapter 14. So to follow along, that would be a great, great idea. Beginning chapter 14, we were a couple days before the Passover, and we know what that means ultimately with our Lord and His crucifixion. And now we're going to be getting into the time to where... We're going to be seeing the betrayal of of Jesus by Judas. And then also um, we're going to be talking about and getting into the Last Supper and the preparation for that Last Supper and what that really means. And so uh, it starts off right now in verse 10 this way. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad. And promised to give him money, so he sought how he might conveniently betray him. I don't know if any of you know this or not, but the name Judas means he shall be praised. Kind of ironic, huh? The name Judah means praise. And instead, here Judas, Judas Iscariot, being known as an apostle who praised Jesus, he is now known throughout history and forever the apostle who betrayed Jesus. And, you know, I was thinking about that. What's in a name? You know, there are so many names out there, and, and uh, people call themselves so many things. But I think about it, what's in the name? Even Judas, we see, had the name of apostle, one who was separated, one who was to be an apostolos, one who was a messenger that was sent, one who was to, to come alongside our Lord and to help spread the gospel of Jesus, that good news to a fallen world. But we can see that it's more than just a name, I think, that we're to be as Christians. That each and every one of us are not only to have the name Christian on us or upon us, but it's to be upon our lives and it's to be evident in our lives and in your life. Each of us cannot walk around just saying, I'm a Christian, and not then demonstrating the things of what Christians are called to do. And, and I think that's where things fall really short in Christianity today. I think the name Christian is, is, is a great name to have. But yet it's more in the being a Christian, the doing of a Christian is what I believe is more important. I'd rather people, as they see me or see you just serving Jesus, let them come up to you and say, you must be a Christian. Well, how did you know? Well, it's just by your countenance. It's just by the way that you love people. It's just by your temperance, maybe, your patience, your long-suffering. You see, it's in what we do and how we demonstrate, and the Scriptures quite know that even as we love one another, it says that they will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And in that, it's not so important to be hooked on a name. Judas was an apostle, as were the other eleven. But we can see even in the name of apostle that in the case of Judas, it didn't really mean much. If you call yourself a Christian here this morning, I think that's great. 
But you better live like a Christian is what I think. You better have a life that is in harmony with Jesus Christ. You better have a life that testifies the Christ, the living Christ that lives within you. It is one thing to call yourself a Christian. And it's quite another thing to live the life of a Christian. A life that is fully surrendered unto Christ and a life that is totally submitted unto Jesus. He goes on to say in those two scriptures, 10 and 11, that Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him. Then it says, and when they heard it, they were glad. I mean, we see here evidently that is Judas who sought them out. They didn't seek him out. He went specifically to seek out a way to betray his Lord. It says that in verse 11 that when they heard about all of this and that he was there and he was all the whole plan, is, it says that they were glad. And in the original language, it means that they rejoiced. <laughs> Go figure that. They rejoiced at the fact that one of his own were coming now to betray him. Verses 12 through 16, it goes on to say here, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? Verse 13, he And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Whenever he goes in, wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the priest, where is the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 15 When then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. It's the time of Passover as we've been told and read in the scriptures, that time where it's it's an incredible celebration. It's a time to where the city of Jerusalem would swell some three, five, ten times its normal size. And in that, many, many people, men requiring to come within a 15-mile radius and those who were able to come still came and to worship. And they're talking here two things because in, verse, in chapter 14, verse 1, it tells us about two, day, two things. It says two days it was Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The two of these celebrations go hand in hand. We have the Passover, but then for the next days forth, coming ahead, seven days, we have the the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I said the two go hand in hand. They go together as one, almost even today, thinking that they're all one celebration, but in fact they're not, because at the Passover meal, the Lord's told the children of Israel that they were not to put yeast into the bread and wait for it to be rising or to rise because they were to make haste. They were to be quick about it because they were to be called to leave Egypt. And so therefore, since they could flee quickly, there was no yeast to be put in the bread. So it's unleavened. It's, it's flat. It's not risen. And it says here in this account, this particular few verses that They're looking for a place to hold this Passover meal. A place to where they could get away. They could celebrate Passover as brothers and sisters. Why is that? Because they had no home. They had no place that they could speak of to where they could hang their hat, kick off their shoes. But instead they were pilgrims as you and I are pilgrims. As they were sojourning and making their pilgrimage from place to place house to house, you and I are the same. And that's why I think it's very important that you and I don't rest and don't uh, totally uh, fall into the things of this world here because you and I are just pilgrims passing through this place for a period of years, 70 years, 80 years, 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is, this place is not your home. And you must know this as Christians. 
And that's why I say in a name, it's not that important just to be considered or called or call yourself a Christian, but you must live as a Christian. And to live as a Christian is one who lives this life, not thinking about this life, not storing up their riches in this life, but more so for eternal riches and living a life that is based on the next life, that life after this one, whatever it is. And that means that you and I are called to be Christians in this life. You and I are called to live like Christians in this life. These guys were pilgrims. You are pilgrims. Understand this, pilgrim, as John Wayne used to say. You're passing by. This ain't your home. Don't worry about this place. It's going to burn. It's going to be thrashed. And you know it, and I know it. It's our heavenly home that we're to be focused on it's heaven that we're to be concerned about and it's because of that concern is how you live here in this place eternity does not start does not start in heaven eternity starts here with each of you this morning this new year maybe some of you made resolutions we'll see how many of you keep them But maybe some of you have said, you know, Lord, there are things that I'm going to step out in faith in. There are things that I'm going to to really do differently this year as you kind of examine 2010 in your life. And I'm speaking as a Christian. I'm not speaking in the workplace. I'm not speaking any other way or any other context. I'm speaking about you as a Christian. And to really evaluate your life in 2010 and say, Lord, what did I do for you this last year? Lord, what areas did I step out in faith in for you this last year? It's nothing to be condemning yourself over. But I believe, as Paul says, that we're to examine ourselves and say, Lord, what have I done for you? God has given each of you here this morning another opportunity. An opportunity to serve Him in 2011. An opportunity to worship Him more. An opportunity to love Him more. An opportunity to seek the things of God more in your life because you call yourselves Christians. Are you Christians? Are you truly those sanctified, set apart, holy for His purpose? If you are, then this year, today, you should be saying, Lord, use me. Use me incredibly much. Use me any day you want, as much as you want. I want to be used by you. What do you think about? What do you say in the morning when you first wake up? Oh man, the alarm hit that a few times, huh? Then you think about your job and go, man, I got to go to work again today. Is that the first thing out of your mouth or in your mind? The first thing should be is like, Lord, use me. Lord, let me glorify your name today. Let me magnify you some way today. Let that be in my life. You're pilgrims. Pilgrims. This isn't your home. You may have aspirations and you may have things that the Lord has even placed upon your heart and maybe is doing even here today. But ultimately, this isn't the place to hang your hat. The place is heaven. And everything you do here is to have a goal for there in heaven. These guys couldn't call any place their home because they had no home. They wandered from home to home. They wandered from place to place Matthew 8, 20, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. These guys wanted to know what to do. Lord, it's Passover. We have no place. We have nowhere to go. What what do we do? You know, Let's read verse 13 again. It says, and, and he sent out two of his disciples. It's reminiscent of what he's already done. 
as he was looking for that foal of a colt to come in on his triumphal entry, he also sent out two disciples. They also, he also directed them and guided them and led them. He says, go, go into the city. And he says, this man is going to meet you there carrying a pitcher of water. And wherever he goes in, I want you to talk to the master of that house and tell him that my teacher has need of this house, your guest room. How many of us, when we don't know what to do, when we have no idea what to do, how many of us truly go to Jesus and ask him and seek him out? Jesus, I I, I don't know where to go. What do I do? Lord, I don't know what to do with my husband or my wife or my child. And what am I to do, Lord? I don't know what to do about this lifestyle I'm involved in, God. What am I to do? We need to do like the disciples have done. They turn to Jesus because they don't know what to do. They're waiting for orders from their master teacher to direct them and to guide them. Are you not the same as these here? Wandering aimlessly through this world, wondering, Lord, what is it you have for me? But then in those times that we don't know, we're like, what are you, where are you going to solve your problems? What answers? Who's giving you the answers to your problems, your situations? your dilemmas, your setbacks, whatever you want to call them, who is giving you the answers? Is it Jesus? Are you going to him? I want to encourage you, never be too proud to ask Jesus for direction. Never be too proud to ask Jesus for help and for guidance. Psalm 31.3 says, For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. Psalm 32, 8, he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you, it says, with my eye. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. That means he's in it for the long haul with you. That means whatever you need, whatever instruction you desire, he's there for you. If you were taking notes, that's Psalm 31, 3, Psalm 32, 8, and Psalm 48, 14. God, God is the one to direct you. Not your best friend. Not your mentor. Not even your pastor. But God. You need to go to God first with everything. Lord, where do I go? Lord, what do I do? Don't go to the Oprah network to get your answers. She's got a new network she's starting. Great. I won't go on that soapbox, but I'm real tempted right now. But anyway, Jesus gives them direction, specific direction. You know, sometimes when we ask things of God, he's not too clear, is he? He just says, well, just continue trusting me. Just continue walking this way. I'll guide you, but I'm not going to fill you in on all the details. That's the surprise. Here, the Lord specifically directs them and gives them every single detail that they would need. And I think that there are definitely those times, I believe, that when the Lord knows you need those details, those finite little things to guide you. Man, he does with me all the time because he knows how often I lose my way. 
He knows how often I, I stumble in a pothole spiritually. He knows that about me. And so the Lord has a great way of dealing with me. And he says, Tom, you know, I, I want you to go down this way and I want you to see this one thing and I want you then to deal with that or, or, or look at that and then pray and then I want you to continue walking and this is what's going to happen next. Maybe some of you have those same experiences. I pray that you do because it is wonderful when God reveals man step by step for you. You kind of don't have to think. And, and you know, this is your step-by-step guide in case you wanted to know. It's your Bible. It's what's sitting on your lap right now. Without this guide, without the Word of God, without His Holy Spirit guiding you and directing you and leading you, then you'll be tuning in to the ratings of the Oprah Winfrey Network. He tells them, he goes, there's going to be a man. Now, I find this interesting. I pray you do too. As you study the scriptures, there's a man that's carrying a pitcher of water. Well, I'm sorry, ladies. Men didn't carry pitchers of water in those days. This is unique, I think. Only women carried pitchers of water. It was only women who were at the well gathering water to take in for their daily provision for the day. Not men. We never read where there's men hanging around the well talking about the events of the day. No, the men were at the city gate handling business, taking care of the city's needs. That's where the men were. The women were doing those things and one of those was gathering water. But here it's interesting that there's a man, he says. You're going to see this man carrying a pitcher of water. It's very distinctive, I believe. So God is really, really showing them. He's not, he's not allowing them not to make any mistake. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, just go on the street and, you know, I'll show you. No, no, he says, this is what's going to happen. Then he also, for the sake of not wanting to be discovered because of his popularity, he says, when you see the master of the house, just tell him the teacher has need of this place. Just the teacher. That's it. I wanted to continue with his anonymity. Then in verse 16, it tells us that his disciples went out came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. I like that in verse 16 where it says, just as he had said to them. Gosh, is Jesus ever wrong? No. Does he ever send you on an errand? Does he ever have you take steps of faith just to have you fall flat on your face? No. No. But Jesus told them exactly what would happen and how things would happen. And I think it is such a blessing. I think it is such a blessing when we hear from the Holy Spirit and he's guiding us and he's leading us. And then it's exactly the way he said it was going to happen. How many of you guys, I do this. It's like, wow, Lord, turned out exactly the way you said. How many of you guys have ever done that? Yet we're surprised, huh? But he's God. Shouldn't it turn out the way that he says it happens? Remember, you're the variable in the whole situation. You can or cannot follow his direction and mess it up. You can or cannot follow his will and do your own will and mess it up. But when we hear from the Holy Spirit... We read his word, he speaks to our hearts, and he gives us marching orders, he gives us something to step out in faith in or something to do, and we follow it. It happens exactly the way he said it would. I like that. When does this happen, though? Well, it happens when we obey Jesus, guys. It happens when we not only hear from him and listen to his words, listen to the Spirit speak to us, but it happens when we obey him. And understand this, that there is blessings in obedience. 
There are huge blessings in obedience. They asked Jesus as far as going to prepare this Passover meal. Where do you want us to go? Well, he tells them and it happens. Exactly what they were to expect happened, happened. Let me ask you guys this question. When you go to Jesus and you ask him for guidance and he guides you and he instructs you, I think the question is, is how do you respond to that guidance and instruction? Well, I believe there's two ways that you can respond. If you respond in obedience, you'll be blessed. Because what that's called is you're in the will of God. But if you respond in disobedience, guess what? You won't be blessed. And it's called being in the will of your own flesh. That's what it's called. You're doing your own thing. You hear from the Lord, but go, yeah, but I'm going to do it my way first, Lord. We're all guilty, aren't we, of that? I don't want to see your hands, but we're all guilty. I know what your word says, Lord. I know what your spirit spoke to me about, Lord, but you know what? Eh, I'm going to shelf that for a minute. I'm going to do it my way. Because I think I know better than you. How many of us know more than our Lord? None of us. And it really comes down to being that simple. It's in our response to his commands. And this, my friends, it means that you and I must be operating in the Spirit. We must be operating in the Spirit to not allow the things of the flesh to take over. Verses 17 through 21, in the evening he came with the twelve. So now it's nighttime. He comes with his twelve guys and he says, And now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? He answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in this dish. The Son of Man indeed goes to just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Here we see the the Lord in that guest room. Everything has already been prepared beforehand. The The two apostles, we don't know who they are. It tells us that they went ahead and they prepared everything for the Passover. And, you know, another thing that I see about that is the the area of service unto the Lord. We don't know who the previous two apostles were. We don't know who these two apostles were. But they served their Lord. And they served their Lord in kind of an anonymous way. Sure, they knew, but you and I don't know. And the fact remains is as they went, their area of service was to be in the physical things. Kind of like the physical things of this church. To make ready in preparation for, in this case, the Passover. Or as we do on Wednesday evenings and Sundays or any other special times. To make ready this sanctuary, this church, the children's ministry, different areas, the parking lot. And there are servants in this church just like these two servants, these two apostles. Who do many, many things in this fellowship without you even knowing who they are. Gee, the floors are vacuumed. Who did them? I don't know. Must be little cherubs here after we leave, huh? Floating around doing things. I think not. It's people like you and me who are just called to serve the Lord and they do things to make ready in preparation, in this case for the Passover, but for us, for our services. And so there's a lot to be said in serving God not just by standing on the pulpit or playing a guitar for all to see, but for doing things behind the wings. You know, behind the curtain, so to speak. Helping someone out. Providing for them, maybe through a meal. 
or physically in this church may be doing something that you're not going to get any notoriety for. But it's just serving God because it's His plan. It's what He wants. Simple obedience, guys. That's all it is. But in 17 through 21, we see that evening comes and He comes with His 12 guys. And it tells us immediately in verse 18, now as they sat and they ate. Now in Egypt, you have to understand this, why this is important. If you note takers, in Egypt, they had to stand while they were eating that Passover meal because they were to make haste. They were commanded to eat that meal standing, but here they are, what does it say? Sitting and eating. Things changed. When did they change? They changed at the time to when they crossed over into the River Jordan, into the Promised Land. Remember, that was to be that land that was to be given as rest for them. And so now in that time, the time of Jesus, they no longer stood as if they were needing to go somewhere, but they were already there. They were already in the promised land. So therefore they sat, or many times they reclined, even as they do today. And they dipped their bread in the the dippings, and they ate, and they fellowshiped even at the Passover meal. It tells us that they stood while eating their Passover meal in Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. But now they're at rest in the promised land, guys. Now they're resting. They don't need to stand. They're not in a hurry to go anywhere. And I think that's important that you and I, as we either come to church or we take communion even today, that each of you understand that you're to be in a place of rest not in a place of hurriedness, being hurried up and fast here and fast to leave church. Oh, it's raining. I better get in my car quick. No, just hang out. Chill a little bit, you know? Stay here. Fellowship. Do like the disciples did. They sat and they ate. They weren't all in a hurry to go somewhere. Now, it also speaks to us about what Judas had done. Understand what Judas had done. Only a friend would sit there at the table in this way, dipping into your, your own dipping. Remember the old double dipping thing? Don't double dip. Hey, it's kind of gross. But in that day, guess what? They doubled and tripled and quadruple dipped all the time. And it was more so of a thing of fellowship and koinonia with one another. It's almost as if as I took that piece of bread and I I dipped it, then I bit it again and I dipped it. It's kind of like part of me, this may gross you out, but this is really how it is. Part of me is like in that dipping bowl. All right, my saliva and stuff. And maybe, you know, the part, part of the pita bread that I ate is like, there and it's in that bowl and then then there you are and you dip it and you're like all right let me tell you only real family does that i would think but but honestly that that is the whole thing behind this whole meal and it's called fellowship it's called koinonia and that word just simply means oneness and you became one with the fellows or the family sitting at your table. And it's a beautiful thing. It truly is. Because not even double dipping is going to prevent me (laughs) from being in fellowship with you. You see, that's the beauty of relationship. And that's what it's like with Christ in your life. There's that koinonia. There's that oneness. As he is in me, Just like when those disciples would dip and he dipped and ate and dipped and part of him was in them. We have the ultimate, ultimate opportunity as Christ has come into each and every one of us. Man, he is dwelling within you. If you are a child of God, he dwells within you and his power is within you. Man, that takes double dipping to a whole new level, doesn't it? He is in you by His Spirit. 
and for Judas, a friend, to betray him. After that incredibly intimate time of gathering together at Passover, dipping. That's why Jesus said, he who dips in here. Now remember, they were all asking the question. It's not like Jesus said, all right, Judas, stand up. This is the dude. This is the guy who's going to betray me, okay? And then they're all like, you know. No, he said, there's one of you at this table. So that's why they all ask the question, is it I? Is it I? Sitting at the table as a friend of Jesus. Wouldn't you have loved to be there? I would have. I would have loved to have been at that table. I believed it was the most honored and coveted place to be at the Lord's table. And that's why we celebrate the Lord during our time of communion. What an incredible time to come to the Lord's table, seek forgiveness, seek admonishment, just pouring your heart out before him. Oh, there is no better place than to come to the Lord's table. That's why when you and I, you know, at the time of the marriage feast of the Lamb, guess what? It's a marriage feast. The Lord gathers his church, and man, we are going to sit at his table, and there's going to be incredible things to eat. It's a marriage feast. What do you do at feasts? You munch, right? It takes Golden Corral to a whole nother level. And I like Golden Corral. Just think of it times a billion, trillion. Man, to sit at the Lord's table, friends, and he doesn't. You know, the Lord, man, he had every right to single out Judas, but he didn't. He gives him a warning instead. By He says, one of you at this table, it's a warning for Judas because Judas knew what he had already done. He had already gone to the scribes. He had already gone to the Pharisees. Those chief priests and said, this is the plan. This is where he always goes and prays. This is where we're going to be going most likely afterwards. He knew Jesus and what he was going to do. And Jesus, instead of zapping him right there, bringing him out, singling him out, he gives him a warning. And it just shows his incredible love. I want you to think about this. It's the love that Christ had for Judas to give him an opportunity to repent right then and there. You guys know what it's like growing up. Maybe your parents, they have you at the dinner table, and maybe you broke something that day. And then your mom or your dad will mention something. It's happened in our household. And you mention it at the dinner table. Gee, I, I wonder how the cookie jar got broken. And they're all looking at each other. Is it me? Is it you? you know, one, of you one of them knows they didn't do it. And the other one knows they did do it. I remember Patrick when he was little and we were living in California. He had eaten some chocolate. Gene found this chocolate wrapper. Patrick had to flush it down the toilet. Some big old wrapper. So much so... He needed to tangle himself in a web. <laughs> he talked his friend across the street to lie for him that he ate the chocolate or he gave it to him, something like that as I remember. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit's good. And it's like, Patrick, did you eat this? No. You see, Gene was giving our son an opportunity for repentance. Gene was giving Patrick an opportunity to say, you're asking me this for a reason, aren't you? Because you probably know I've done this. But in his little mind, little deceitful mind, he's like, no, she doesn't know. Otherwise, she wouldn't be asking me. No, it was Michael across the street. I gave it to him. See, what love is that? It's not a condemning love, but it's an opportunity 
of love that Jesus gave Judas to say, hey, I know what's going on. I'm giving you an opportunity. This was his last chance to repent and not fulfill his plot. Even though what he did fulfilled prophecy, it was still his own wicked, wicked heart that condemned him. Finishing up in verses 22 through 25, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink in the, drink it new in the kingdom of God. See, Jesus says, take. He says, take this. Eat it. Jesus never forces it upon anyone. He says, here, if you want it, it's yours. Jesus doesn't force his relationship upon us. Jesus doesn't force his commandments upon us. But instead, he says, hey, take this, eat it. He wants us to eat it because, and he tells them, he says, eat this because he knows it's needful for them. It's necessary for them to take that and to eat that. He speaks about a new covenant here in these scriptures. What's he talking about? What does he mean about this new covenant? Well, this new covenant Jesus refers to is about this inner transformation that's going to be cleansing people from sin. The very fact of of, of calling upon the name of Christ and giving our lives over to Christ, immediately, immediately, we are cleansed of sin. Immediately. It's like those little things that they came out with now that take stains off of walls and marks. You know, those little things you buy at Walmart? You wet them and then you wipe it and it's like, it's gone. The stain is gone. I don't know how thing is just this little thing, but it's gone. Jesus does the same thing in our lives. And that's the new covenant that he speaks about, that inner thing, that inner transforming that cleanses you and me from sin. Jeremiah 31, 34 says this, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, he says. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Isn't that great? Does that not float your boat, Christians? That as you come to Jesus Christ, guess what? He promises, promises he will forgive you of your iniquity and he will no longer remember your sin. 1 John 1, 9 says the same thing. Tells us that if we seek forgiveness, if we ask forgiveness of our sin, he's faithful and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise, a promise. You guys should be like jumping in your seats right now. Because it's a wonderful, wonderful, nothing else, no one else can or ever will be able to do that except for Jesus Christ. The second thing that I see about this is the tra- about this new covenant is the transformation puts God's word and puts his will in you. So the first is a transformation from within that cleanses you of sin. The second is, is that this transformation puts his word and puts his will in you. In you. Jeremiah 31 33 says, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Wow. He promises that. Jeremiah 31 33. Then also, in that same Jeremiah 31 33, the other part is it provides Jesus here, this new covenant, with a close relationship. A close relationship. And he goes on to say in that verse, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wow. 
He wants relationship. He seeks it. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you can have a new covenant relationship with him. Jesus goes on to declare in, in the following scriptures and in verse 25, when he says, I say to you, I'll no longer drink of the fruit of the vine that day when I drink it, the new kingdom of God. He says he's not going to celebrate Passover in heaven because he's waiting for the gathering of his children. And then there'll be the great supper like I talked about. Revelation 19.9 speaks of the marriage supper of the Lamb. There will be an incredible time. And that's what Jesus longs for. That's the fulfillment of what he longs for. It says that they went to, in verse um, 26, that they had sung a hymn, went out to Mount, the Mount of Olives, and Jesus had said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if, I, even if all are made to stumble... Yet I will not. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, Peter. But he spoke no more, but he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Every one of the guys behind him, like, Yeah, Peter, you're right. We feel the same way. Then they came to a place which he named Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John and with him and began to, to be troubled and deeply distressed. Well, this worshiping, and I'm just going to ask the worship team to come forward as we get into communion this morning. Worshiping the Lord, guys, in song is important. We see that Jesus did it here. You know, how many of you guys think of Jesus as singing? Show me your hands. How many? Do you, do you, I never did. I don't know. I think of Jesus more teaching, heal, teaching, preaching, and healing. You know, Matthew tells us that. It tells us about the, the Gospels, and that's what he did. And I'm thinking, praise the Lord for you guys who think of Jesus as singing. Because I never think of him as, like, singing. But he, being an, an awesome Jewish man, was called to sing as well. I think this shows you, as he sings, that it shows you that God wants to be praised with singing. Man, when we worship him, we should be singing to him. Worship ain't about yourself. It ain't about how good you sound or how bad you sound. It ain't about how you look while you're worshiping. It's just worshiping. See, worship is not about us. It's not about you. It's about me. I mean, no, I'm sorry. It's not about me. The Lord says it's about me. <laughs> Woo, that's wrong. That's wrong. It's hot in here, isn't it? No. It's about me, says the Lord. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, how am I going to get out of that one? Do you know that there's, in fact, 40 different passages in Scripture in Psalms, on how God wants you to praise Him. There's over 40 verses, over 40 passages on how you are called to praise the Lord. I'll give you a few. Psalm 30, verse 4. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I'm sorry, that's Psalm 9, verse 2. Now Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of His, of his and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. That's Psalm 47, 6. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding, Psalm 47, 7. That's just a few of over 40. That was Psalm 9, 2, Psalm 30, verse 4, Psalm 47, 6, and Psalm 47, 7. I think it's amazing to see Jesus sing at this time. Do you think it's kind of odd that he's singing? Knowing what he's going to go through? 
Could you sing in the same circumstance as Jesus here? Knowing that you're going to be crucified? Knowing that the minute you're going to step out, you're going to be murdered? Charles Spurgeon says this, I mean, in singing in circumstance. I want to encourage you guys and, and definitely close with this. He says, what? A Christian silent when others are praising his master? No. He must join in the song. Satan tries to make God's people dumb, but he cannot. For the Lord has not a tongue-tied child in, his, in all his family. They can all speak and they can all cry, even if they cannot all sing. And I think there are times when they can all sing. Yes, they must, for you know the promise. Then shall the tongue of the dumb sing. Surely when Jesus leads the tune, if there should be any silent ones in the Lord's family, they must begin to praise the name of the Lord. They sang the traditional Hallel Passover songs, which is the Psalms 116 through 118. And so praise is important to the Lord. Singing unto him for him to praise him. It's not about you and me. One thing to keep in mind. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Because now it's our time that we get to praise him. We get to praise him. Think upon him. And we get to worship him this morning through communion. And remember about what Jesus said about the new, new covenant. That one that is going to be transforming within you. That sin. The one that is going to be bringing to you relationship with him. Close relationship. Koinonia. Oneness. So as the worship team begins right now, I'm just going to pray.